Well, I think this is the ad hoc place tonight to uh, present my topic on uh, dance and this relation with Jewish mistresses for two main reasons. Students are very well prepared. Uh, it's a unique university in the sense that you read the three cantica. It's not, that, it's not commonly done. And uh, also we have our annual uh, symposium with the Hollanders which is a continuous source of uh, you know, dialogue and exchange of opinions, I think is really the best place to, to talk about a topic that may be a bit sui generis, quite frankly, but I feel confident that my audience tonight will uh, receive the topic in a positive way. Just for my, I, I have a curiosity here, statistic curiosity. How many of you have ever heard of the Zohar, of the Book of Splendor? Good. How about the Bahir? Okay, we do have. So. And what about the Hebrew Book of Enoch? Yeah, okay. So, okay. We have a very well prepared audience here. Okay, great. So, um, well, I guess let me also change the slides here <laughs> to. Uh, to uh, begin our conversation tonight. So uh, we know, of course, that uh, uh, the Divine Comedy has a complexity, immense complexity. Per se, we can think uh, of the Divine Comedy as a continuous source of revelation, kind of a sacred text, especially for literary criticism, because the more we study, the more we feel that um, secrets and teachings are continuously uh, revealed. And what we do today is sort of keeping the dialogue. What we do today is exactly the same idea of this literary criticism that started uh, immediately with, uh, with uh, really with uh, Giovanni Boccaccio with the production of the Divine Comedy in the 14th century and that's never stopped. The continuous dialogue Critics have been involved, and we know that the Divine Comedy can be studied in so many different ways. Um, I think the most innovative studies that come to my mind are uh, with Echo, and of course the um, idea of the, the uh, composition of the restoration of this ideal language to be able to communicate with God, with semiotic, of course. So we know that there's been a very engaging dialogue. We love to indulge in this dialogue. And the, really, the most renowned critics, of, I can just mention a few in Italy, Savegno, Natalino Savegno, De Santis, have been engaged in this uh, dialogue, continuous dialogue, about Dante formation, about this exile, about the cultural influence on Dante. Now, for the most part, though, we have to recognize that traditionally, and rightly so, criticism has been rooted in the classic tradition. We know that uh, Homer, Virgil, Lucretius, Ovid, and uh, of course, La Scolastica, uh, Sant Agostino, San Tommaso, we know that these are sources uh, very important for Dante. What has been a little perhaps less emphasized and only because we didn't have historical um, evidence, I should say, although we always had the intuition and we always knew that there was a little bit more, is about the influence of Jewish mysticism, which we know is a very ancient tradition and very important has permeated, of course, the Mediterranean basin intensively. So a, res a very recent study by Moshe Dell, I'm sure that many of you know him, he's a fabulous historian, um, and um, in a very recent publication, and uh, I kind of, I'm sorry, I resist a little bit the word Kabbalah, because I, you, you have noticed that I use Jewish mysticism instead, only because it's been <laughs> publicized so much in the pop world that we tend, tend to trivialize the word Kabbalah, the discipline of Kabbalah. So uh, if you prefer to, we can just agree and talk about Jewish mysticism, but there is, of course, within Jewish mysticism, this uh, component. So he's telling us in his uh, um, fabulous studies, telling us that um, 
If we look at the geography of Italy, of course we see here that we have some fabulous ports in the southern part of Italy, in uh, Bari, Taranto, Palermo, especially in Sicily here, but uh, really all the, the southern region of Italy is very well connected uh, through the Mediterranean, of course, to the main source, the original source of uh, Jewish mysticism, which, uh, according to uh, Idel, um, basically had the possibility to be imported through Italy with destination to the other uh, European countries, Provence, we know there was a very fervid area for mysticism, but also Germany, of course, and Spain. But the most important thing to remember is that we know now, uh, we have historical evidence to say that uh, the, fa the cultural fabric of the Italian peninsula at the time of, uh, of course, the production of the Divine Comedy was very well aware of Jewish mysticism, the tradition. And when I say a tradition, I'm very careful to say that because uh, we talk about written text, but not only, of course. We talk about oral tradition, uh, teaching dialogues, uh, fragments, and uh, things of that sort. And I will develop a little bit that idea, but I just want to give you the historical background on which we can then uh, develop our our argument here. Another important historical uh, evidence that we should not neglect is the interaction, of course, of Dante with the very famous scholar Emmanuel Ben Solomon. Is a native of Rome, but uh, very active, of course, in Rome, but uh, um, he belongs to the community of Fermo. Fermo, uh, in the region of Marche, has always been very important for Jewish communities in Italy. We know also that this the, the region, the birthplace of um, Leopardi, as well rooted in the tradition of uh, Jewish mysticism. So Emmanuel Ben Solomon, uh, also known as uh, Manuelito e Romano, maybe you may have read something under this pseudonym, or Emmanuel e Romano. So we, of course, uh, Dante is uh, uh, an important figure, and we always talk about the influence that Dante had on Emmanuel. But we should also be um, perhaps take into consideration the fact that Emmanuel was a theologian and, of course, very uh, erudite in biblical study and the, the idea of uh, allegory and uh, symbolism, and also from a language point of view, typical of the Jewish mysticism, the value of words, of letter, uh, gematria, uh, the, uh, basically when uh, each letter corresponds to as a numerical value and it changes according to the location and verbs, the same thing. So a very intricate uh, um, study in what is the, uh, the, the, the biblical text. So um, we know for a fact that Emmanuel Ben Solomon and Dante have exchanged letters. We know for a fact also that Dante during his exile uh, through Italy has been in contact with the um, community that had the tradition of Jewish mysticism. Uh, this is uh, an image of Fermo in the region of Marche. You will notice that most of these places are mystical in nature, me uh, meaning that they really favor this uh, meditation and this idea of wanting to be in contact with, to understand more about divine creation. But uh, Marche, again, is a fabulous region in Italy. Many of these towns are isolated geographically because you can notice that they are on hills or mountains. Therefore, culture has been preserved more pristine than uh, in other cities that are more cosmopolitan. And here you find libraries and archives, which, frankly, we are opening now. They are uh, owned by private families, too. It's a matter, of course, of, a, of having the right connections. But Fermo, of course, is a, uh, 
a very important intellectual uh, time. So we talked about this idea of Jewish mysticism, and you you told me some of the students have read this text, so I'm very uh, I'm confident that uh, for the most part we can follow at least in general terms what we want to say tonight. So when we talk about uh, a Jewish mysticism, we said we talk about the tradition that is complex. Um, is based on written text. We do have some written texts that, for the most part, they are coherent, we can say, although very complex. However, please, although I here I say that uh, I, I, we basically mention one name for each book as an author just because that author tried to uh, combine the tradition. This does not mean that it's a coherent text because it's not the nature, of course, of Jewish traditional mystical Jewish uh, production. So we said uh, we start with, uh, uh, of course, Ezekiel, we know biblical text, and from Ezekiel we will take essentially the vision of the chariot, the prodigious chariot, one of the most beautiful images that we have had that has been ever produced and reproduced in paintings and in description. So, of course, biblical text. We should also mention the book of Daniel, which also has uh, visions. Then we have the Zohar, of course, the book of splendor, and some of you are familiar with this text. Moshe de Leon, again, is a corpus, uh, there is a coherent structure in it, but please uh, don't think that these are texts that have an introduction, a development, and an end. No, it's mainly a, a gathering of notes, of uh, dialogues, exchange of, of course, comments, biblical comments, and at times are just fragments, and we're not sure where they, you know, about the sequence, but more or less. We, we have a general idea. Again, uh, is, uh, most of it is oral tradition, produced still today, mainly in Safed, and uh, uh, is uh, transmitted from uh, teacher to, to student, but there are some notes that, you know, there, is some, uh, there are some uh, documents, written documents. Then we have the Bahir, which is uh, the, uh, one of the most important texts, very, very complex. And we encounter the same uh, kind of history in the text. Uh, for the Book of Enoch, some of you, the Hebrew, the third one, because we have three of them. Uh, this is, of course, the, uh, you know, we have fragments. We can trace them back. You, uh, you're familiar with the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there are fragments of uh, um, that document. And also, it's a non-canonized -canon part of the Hebrew Bible, if we really want to just uh, give a definition. So this corpus, this main, these are the texts that basically uh, we can say the essence of what we call the Jewish uh, mystical tradition. Now, we have a fabulous German scholar, one of the most erudite, and I am in love with him, I must admit, and I read everything he, he produced. He, he really produced a massive, uh, massive volumes about the tradition of Jewish mysticism. Of course, I'm talking about Scholem, born in Germany. He died in, uh, in Jerusalem. He was professor at the University of Jerusalem for many years. And he was the one that uh, attempted to organize this, uh, the history of Jewish uh, mysticism, with doing an excellent uh, job, of course. So um, you may have heard that uh, uh, when we talk about Jewish mysticism, you may have heard the word Merkaba, the Merkaba. And this goes back to the idea of the vision of the chariot, so Ezekiel vision of the chariot, because we know that the triad R, B, K is the root word for some sort of, well, we say chariot or way to transport. If we want to be really technical, perhaps the best way to describe it is the brain that tries to elevate becomes uh, transcends reality and elevates, so acquires 
supernatural um, qualities to, in an attempt to understand divine creation. So it's tradition of the Merkaba. Whenever you hear the Merkaba, these are accounts of uh, the experience of the divine, an attempt to experience the divine, uh, ascent to Pardes or Paradise, exactly what Dante is doing in the Divine Comedy. And there are two elements that are very intriguing. So we see that both in Jewish uh, mysticism and in Dante, in the Divine Comedy, there is this desire to ascend, to experience uh, the glory of God, God creation, to have a better understanding of God creation. And uh, perhaps this is the most interesting thing, the technique, because we have to analyze the text a bit in a scientific way. I like to do this. I guess it's my archaeological formation. I like to approach literature a little bit with concrete evidence. So there are techniques to follow in order to achieve the, this, this uh, elevation. And it's really remarkable to see the uh, I shouldn't say coincidence, because for, frankly here there is a, an inter a cultural interaction, but there are very similar elements followed in the Jewish, uh, in Jewish mysticism and in the Divine Comedy to achieve this mystical experience. Are you with me so far? Yes. Oh, I am a good teacher. This is, this is difficult stuff here. Okay. So let's progress. Okay, so I want to show you, this is the city, the town of Safet in uh, northern uh, Israel. It's near the Golan, uh, of course, in the Golan Heights. Um, a fabulous place uh, where, I would say, the ideal place to retire. We can, there we can meditate and live there in peace and really meditate to God's creation and you know, be in direct contact with the divine. But this has functioned in history. So, uh, I would say, I would, you know, if you want to have just comparison, kind of like Assisi in Italy. So it's a central mysticism, very ancient, still there, of course. The schools are very selective, very private, very, the teaching is very uh, selected. So um, the tradition continues. And again, it's based mostly on oral teaching, dialogue in form of dialogue. Um, just, you know, coherent with the, uh, with the original idea of uh, teaching through this uh, continuous exchange of opinion. Okay, so now uh, I would like to progress, dissect a little bit my topic tonight, and to show how both uh, in the traditional Jewish mysticism and in the divine comedy, we follow similar, um, there are some fixed techniques that uh, uh, I believe to, in, to, to induce, to uh, create this uh, um, closeness with the mental closeness, our understanding of uh, uh, divine revelation. So um, there is a tripartite configuration of the spiritual journey. So we know that the number three is considered the perfect number. It's the number of Trinity, of course, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's the number of the, the creation, Father, Mother, and Son. So the creation, the way life continues. is the number three is, permeates the divine comedy. When you have the divine comedy in your hands, before you think about the content, before you think about how Dante populated the, the literary work, just look at it as a structure. The structure is incredible. So it's divided in three cantica. Each cantica is divided in uh, cantos, and then each cantos in terzina. Each terzina, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, it's incredible how it's structured. The Divine Comedy is a structure very, very, all, of course, developed on this idea of three, multiple or threes. So what do we mean with this number three? Well, again, going back to, the, the, uh, to Jewish mysticism, we see that uh, uh, the text 
that uh, we were talking about a minute ago, so in the Bahir, in the Zohar, the Book of Splendor, um, we had this idea that maybe the best, uh, uh, if you want to have an image, is the image of the flame, consuming fire, in fact. We call it consuming fire. So the fire must have a base, some substance to burn, and usually it's black, it's dark, it's the material world. Then there is the first layer of the flame is red. And then the flame kind of purifies itself and becomes white light. So we have these three progressive stages. Now, we can think also about spiritual elevation in the same way. We have to uh, deal with the world, the, the loss in the world, the concept of sin, the concept of... Uh, um, of course, I say mosaic laws, commandments. So uh, then only after that, only after an acceptance of this divine laws, then we can kind of um, progress to a higher spiritual uh, dimension. So there is this idea that we have to go through this tripartite uh, progression, spiritual progression. So in order to understand divine revelation, in order to be closer, I shouldn't say understand because it's too, the, the task is huge, but at least to go to come close to that, to that uh, mystical experience, we need to purify our soul. So the first step is the acceptance of divine loss. Now, uh, this is the question of Inferno. Uh, in Inferno, Dante uh, analyzes the sinners and sins. And according to the law of contrapasso, the contrapasso law, for each sin, there is a punishment, a corresponding punishment. So, of course, this is a less moral lesson, very well described by Dante. But Dante also tells us something else. He tells us that the worst punishment for the sinners is actually what? Well, of course, is the uh, expiation of the, the sin, but most of all is the, um, basically the, the, the loss of hope, right? To access divine grace, to see the light of God, to see God. So the, the, the highest pleasure in life is the experience of, uh, of the divinity of creation. And this is what really is the real punishment of uh, the sinners in Inferno. So Dante is telling us, if we don't accept this loss, if we don't accept God, God's loss, then we live in a state of bestiality. Then we are so consumed with our sins and with our uh, hedonistic drives that we will never progress to a higher understanding of what, well, that spiritual elevation. So if we see then the progression from Inferno, which is this idea of, you know, really Dante shows us what this world would be, the world without the loss. Then there is this intermediary stage, which is Purgatorio. And in the Divine Comedy, we know with the Dr. Hollander, every year we talk about this idea of Purgatorio as Dante invention. Because uh, it is, it is, it's a literal invention. But it's a stage in which the soul is purified and begins to ascend. So it really gives us this visual idea of the elevation. And then, of course, we are in Paradiso Pardes, where there is this pleasure, the immense pleasure of the soul, because by perhaps pure intuition, we uh, experience this enlightenment. Now, I must say, Dante, I really believe we are very intrigued by Dante because his poetic description of the mystical experience are like anything that we have read anywhere. I mean, it's, it's beautiful in poetry, but it's also very detailed. He tells us exactly 
I think we can almost study it from a, a, a physiological point of view and see how the brain and how the soul goes through this stage of elevation because it tells us exactly what happens. It tells us as the soul, the mind in progression loses the idea of time, of space, and what here on earth seems to be chaotic, there is in perfect order. So it really describes us every detail of this mystical experience. But again, going through this uh, uh, tripartite kind of journey, epic journey, if we want. And in Judaism as well, we said, especially in the, bo in the Book of Splendor, in the Zohar, there is this idea of Nefesh, Ruah, Neshama, so this uh, acquisition of a higher soul, of a higher, uh, uh, of a purity that then will allow us to experience the divinity of God. Now, uh, to be a bit archaeologist here, uh, well, we, we, are, we all are familiar with the configuration of the tripartite uh, design of the, the afterworld, Dante afterworld. We can see that is based on the idea of circular shapes, the three, uh, the three uh, realms, and uh, the highest one, of course, Empyreo. So we see this is obvious that there is an escalation from the material to a much more pure uh, sphere. Um, here, this is the tree of the Sephiroth. And I must tell you that we could spend years um, just, you know, trying to comment the Sephiroth. And uh, it is just, you know, material for uh, immense dialogue. But let me just simplify, simplify a little bit what, how we're comparing these two pictures. So here in the Sephiroth, we see as well the circular shapes. And we see how, perhaps if you, I don't know if I can convey the picture, but it is shaped in form of a flame, where the middle part here, the two circular shapes, are more in relation to the earth, and then in progression, we have more abstract thinking. So um, the idea of circular shape is very hypnotic. We know this. When I say that Dante wrote in Tercina, try to recite the old divine comedy in Tercina. Try to do this if you can. The old divine, the Tricantica, is very hypnotic. Even if you don't understand, the, uh, you know, especially in Italian where the rhyme is there, even if you don't understand the meaning of the text, I assure you it's very Kabbalistic. Kabbalistic, I mean that it really has this hypnotic, physically speaking, as an hypnotic effect on the brain, kind of like a prayer or, you know, the recitation, of course, of rhymes, which are perfect. So what we're saying here is that these were exercises, they still are, exercises for the brain. Let's call them contemplation, meditation, or a prayer, whatever you wish to call. But these are exercises that are conducted in order, again, to transcend the material world and to um, elevate, of course, our, uh, um, our brain to... Uh, more uh, to, to, to the divine mystery, the revelation of the divine mystery. So this is uh, basically, um, I guess, a visual, a visual comparison of the two ideas. Because remember that also Dante talks about Gironi. He talks about Giron. So he gives us this always, this, I don't know, when you're in the divine comedy, you kind of feel this vertigo physical vertigo, especially in Inferno, we feel that. So this is an element that we find in these two traditions. Now, I also want to address, uh, ee, oh, this is really Kabbalistic, now we're stuck. I don't know what I did, Becky, ah! Maybe we can physically advance. Yeah, physically advance.
Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. So we can physically actually advance it. Then. Oh, okay, perfect. I am multitask. I can do this. So the importance of a leading master. So we know that in the Divine Comedy, the importance of uh, Virgil is, uh, oh, is really uh, crucial. Uh, there is a continuous dialogue uh, between uh, Virgil and Dante. Virgil is the leading master. At times, he actually helps Dante when he's in danger. But we also see that uh, the interaction with the, of Dante then later is uh, leading master will become Beatrice. So we're always very intrigued by the fact that we have two leading, the, 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 the leading master actually becomes a female figure. And we will talk about that in a minute. But in the meantime, I want to tell you that usually in this progression, in this elevation of the soul, and this journey, or in the attempt to elevate our mind um, to understand the order of the universe, the cre God's creation, it's very helpful to do this through dialogue, a continuous dialogue. Of course, this is rabbin uh, rabbinic tradition as well, and uh, it's what we're doing tonight here. Because by talking, continuing this, I mean, uh, everywhere, uh, in every place, at, uh, at every time, this is adding and adding and adding to the revelation of divine uh, will. By the fact that we talk, we're adding and we're continuing this process of revelation. So even when we say nonsense, we're still doing a positive thing because it's meant to be. That's part of the revelation and the process of revelation. So we see, uh, again, a similar, similar uh, tradition in the dialogue between the rabbi and the, and the student. So, um, of course, this is in relation of the exegesis of the Torah and the, and the sacred text in general, biblical exegesis as well. And I want to give you an example of this dialogue so that we uh, maybe can compare uh, the text. So, uh, in Paradiso uh, 2, Le Terzine 48, 57, 48, 57, I, it's painful for me to read it in English, but please forgive me. So we have, this is the, the beautiful uh, dialogue between Beatrice and Dante, when we see Beatrice, Beatrice is the one, the scientist here. Dante is asking about the spots on the moon, and Beatrice is giving the explanation. So uh, we have a female figure. Beatrice, of course, is the moral guide for Dante, but this also una maestra. Uh, the same uh, idea we find also in the text of Jewish mysticism, when the female being creation of God, this counterpart is needed there because without the female, we only can have a partial understanding of divine creation. And without the male, we only can have a, a partial understanding. So we always have these two figures. Now, in the tradition of Jewish mysticism, the divinity is so the female, the, represent, the female representation is the Shekinah, the glory of God. And of course, in, uh, in Christian tradition, it's the Virgin Mary. And, uh, we know that uh, Beatrice, Beatrice here is the Donna Angelo, so she's elevated, of course, to a an angelic dimension, but um, the function is the same. And so we see here this small di short dialogue. But now tell me, what are the dark spots on this planet's body that there below on Earth have made men tell the tale of Cain? She smiled somewhat, and then she said, if the opinions mortals hold fall into error when the senses key cannot unlock the truth, you should not be struck by arrows of amazement. Once you recognize that reason, even when supported by the senses, has short wings. I love it. 
In the Zohar, we have a very, very similar dialogue. And of course, this is between uh, Rabbi Abad and Rabbi Elazar, or Rabbi, whatever you prefer to say. So Rabbi Abba observed, in heaven above and on the earth below, how great are the works of the Holy One, be blessed. Who fathoms it, how these two stars come from different points, how they meet and disappear. Again, uh, questions about God's creation, how things are organized in the way they are, and at times they seem totally irrational to us, seen from here. And Rabbi Elatzar answered, nor did we need to see these two stars to reflect on them, for we have pondered on them as we have on the multitude of great works that the Holy One be blessed is ever doing. So the mystery of creation. How do we try to understand the mystery of the creation? Through dialogue, to an everlasting dialogue, the outpouring of um, observation and opinion, and usually through the help of a master. So another element that we have observed, we see in the Divine Comedy, a constant dialogue between the master and the student. Now, um, so here, let me uh, talk a little bit about something that we, uh, we find. Here we have the functional mystical practices to achieve spiritual elevation. Uh, we know that uh, in the many accounts of the mystical uh, experience. And Dante, of course, gives us, as we said, the very precise account. He tells us all the details. He tells us exactly how his brain, mind, soul elevates from the terrestrial reality uh, to this uh, realm of uh, very spiritual uh, dimension. But there are techniques, as we were saying, contemplation, meditation, and there are also some steps, some typical uh, uh, images that we see in all accounts. Now, the vision of the chariot, a very beautiful um, vision of this prodigious chariot, uh, I am very intrigued by this description because truly is an artistic, um, you know, one of the most artistic representation of divine vision, but it's also a very uh, interesting sy symbolic image, of, again, of the brain. Perhaps what Ezekiel is telling us is that with the proper preparation, our brain can achieve, can reach high, high uh, levels of understanding, perhaps just by intuition, not logic, but these wheels, these angels, all this intricate uh, shape of the, the, the chariot is just incredible. I want to clarify, Ezekiel never said the word uh, chariot again. This is the Merkaba tradition, so it's what we I guess it's the easiest way to describe this experience because our brain always needs some visual representation. It's very difficult to talk about these concepts that are highly abstract. And Dante in Purgatorio Canto 30, I'm sure you are very, you all love this uh, terzina, talks about the contemplation of the chariot. I mean, the, the contemplation of the chariot is a sign that we are in the presence of God, that our brain, that our mind is elevated to uh, basically um, a dimension, a very high spiritual dimension. So um, we said the same thing and uh, is expressed by Ezekiel in this prodigious, in the description of this prodigious chariot. So I want to actually show you the chariot and try to uh, read you what the description tells us. So this is Beatrice. This is Botticelli, of course, describing it. And it's given material to wonderful paintings. But here it says, Dante tells us, Cotali in sulla divina basterna si levar cento ad voce in tanti senis, ministre messager di vita eterna. 
So very, very similar description of the chariot of Ezekiel. This one, I'm sorry, the script is scrambled, but I will read the description to you. Okay. Ezekiel vision consists of a chariot made of many heavenly beings driven by the likeness of a man. Four beings from the basic structure of the chariot. These beings are called the living creatures. The Hebrew word is ahayot, ahayot. The bodies of the creatures are like that of a human being, but each of them has four faces corresponding to the four direction of the chariot. The chariot can be driven in four directions. The faces are that of a man, a lion, and an ox. Each chayot, angel, has four wings. Two of these wings are spread across the length of the chariot and are connected with the wings of the angel on the other side, below but not attached to the feet of the chariot of the chayot. Angels are other angels that are shaped like wheels. I love this description. The wheels of the chariot are made of angels. These wheels angels, which are described as the wheel inside the wheel, are called Ophanim. This is the famous uh, a description of the different function of the angels. So beautiful image of, again, uh, the chariot of Ezekiel, which has such an important function in uh, Jewish mystical tradition. We can say this is the base, historical base of Jewish mystical tradition. Okay, I want to go back for a second to this idea of the as we were saying, it's essential to this, uh, um, to the experience of the divine. So we will see uh, later, a little bit later, that uh, the invocation to the Virgin Mary in Canto 33, at the culmination of the mystical experience, Dante mystical experience, is the conditio sine qua non. Uh, Dante can be given permission. So uh, the Virgin Mary function as intermediaria, intermediator between the prayer of man and the acceptance of the prayer. So Dante is very clear in this. In fact, he concludes the divine comment telling us uh, if you really wish your prayer to have wings, aver le ali, so to be heard by God, you have to pray to the Virgin Mary. The, the prayer is, of course, uh, directed by St. Bernard and contains two main requests. The first request is that Dante uh, will ex to give Dante this extraordinary gift to experience uh, divine creation, or to have at least a fragment or fragment of what this fabulous order of the universe is. But the second request, equally important, that Dante may come back in column, that his mind is safe. Because keep in mind, of course, that these mystical experiences are very strong, they're very deep. So to keep sun, it is part of the process. In fact, also in, uh, in the tales of our beloved uh, mystics in Safed, they always tell us, be careful, don't go close to this material. Do, do this, practice, practice mysticism only if you are very well prepared, because this is not material for everybody. And I must tell you, the school is very selective. It's not really... It requires a long preparation. Uh, usually, I want to give you just the, I guess, theological or historical, uh, uh, I guess, idea of what they mean. It took 40 years um, to the Hebrew people to reach the land of Israel. So 40 years of preparation should be <laughs> the years needed to attempt to have this divine revelation. There is a sort of an historical uh, uh, similitudine there. Okay, so uh, 
we said that the female figure is very important in Dante, uh, we, no question about it. We have two female, of course, there's the divine figure of uh, the Virgin Man, that is um, Beatrice. Uh, by the way, Beatrice here is also uh, elevated to the form of uh, La Donna Angelo, based on the tradition of the still novismo where, of course, the woman is elevated to moral guide for the man. The woman is not seen as an object of desire uh, uh, in the, the beauty, the physical beauty is not really emphasized, but the soul and this idea of uh, the, noble, the, uh, the noble guide for the man. So, uh, again, Beatrice to takes the dimension of form of divine uh, or angelic figure. So uh, we said that this is very important because, of course, a man without the counterpart, without the dialogue with the female, cannot have a complete understanding of divine creation. And in fact, the glory of God, the Shekinah, the presence of God in Jewish tradition is very important. Uh, even when, uh, I mean, this doesn't mean that the man and the woman have to be physically close, but this means that there is a mental connection that uh, um, is, of, uh, is, of course, the premise of this uh, complete understanding of divine creation. So both the Dante and, uh, and Jewish mysticism uh, function in the same way. Now, I want to read to you this invocation of the Virgin Mary because I know my students love it and they have memorized it. So, please read it with me. So, I will read you. We have both texts here, so you can follow the English, but I know many of you know this by heart, by memory. So, the invocation of uh, San Bernard, uh, the opening of uh, Canto 33, Paradiso, which is the, this is the premise to what then will be Dante uh, mystical experience, vision. And so uh, Dante tells us, Vergine madre, figlia del tuo figlio, umile d'alta, più che creatura, termine fisso d'eterno consiglio. Tu sei colei che l'umana natura nobilitasti sì, che il suo fattore non disdegnò di farsi sua fattura. Nel ventre tuo si riaccese l'amore per lo cui caldo, nell'eterna pace e così è germinato questo fiore. Tu sei a noi meridiana pace di carità e giuso, in tra i mortali sei di speranza, fontana vivace donna, sei tanto grande e tanto vali che qual vuol grazia e a te non ricorre, sua disianza vuol volar sansali, la tua benignità non pur soccorre a chi dimanda, ma molto fate. Liberamente al dimandar precorre in te misericordia, in te magnificenza, in te beltà, in te saduna, quantunque in creature di bontate. Leni cosa sono questi che dall'ultima laguna dell'universo la vita spirituale è avveduta ad una ad una in suo forza. So beautiful invocation to the Virgin Mary. Then eventually we have a line, and we don't have tonight time for everything, but uh, there's a beautiful line, where Dante, of course, are gli occhi da lei diletti e venerati uh, nell'orator si posa. So the Virgin Mary just always oh, fabulous, poetically said, she looks from Dante, she looks up and gives the and gives the permission. Va bene. So she liked the invocation. Okay, we have um, here oh, yeah. oh, this is uh, Signorelli, yes, Dante emerged in his uh, studies and again probably studying of course all the sources, Latin and all the, we said, Virgil and David and Lucrezio and Sant'Agostino and San Tommaso, and, but perhaps among them also the uh, work of uh, Emmanuel Ben Solomon and other texts. So, um, we know this, uh, that uh, both in uh, um, Dante and in Jewish mystical text, we have an intricate, detailed 
configuration of celestial spheres as layered in order of angels. Um, some of you have read the book of the third book of Enoch. So I would say all in the, of the, the, the Jewish mystical text, that is the one that is just totally packed with, with the list of uh, names of angels going on for uh, extensively. Uh, because there, there is this idea in the tradition that in order to access uh, divine will, the soul has to go, or the mind has to go, or the spiritual, I guess, training has to um, enter seven chambers. And these seven chambers of palaces, divine palaces, are guarded by angels. So uh, here there is, of course, a Langeologia, a very complex, intricate um, discipline. Uh, I must say, on a personal note, my grandfather's name uh, was Cherubino, a very, very unique name. So every time I mention my name, people are a little bit uh, the cow's my Cherubino, and you see, it's a rare name. But this is a rare name, but the name of, uh, of course, divine uh, value. So uh, the angel, the Cherubini, uh, specifically, are very dear to my heart. But in any case, we also know from Platonic description, and I want to touch on Neoplatonism too, because this is a bit of a, this is an important topic here too, uh, that whenever we, um, so we feel that there is this uh, ascension that our uh, uh, soul, our understanding, our whatever you wish to, our fate, whatever you, however you wish to define, is getting closer to um, the divinity, to the mystery of uh, God. Uh, there is, according to the description, this uh, uh, so-called celestial music. Musica Seraphia, Plato talked about this. So there are, in the description, we have um, usually the hierarchical uh, layers of angels, and we also have, we have the, the vision of the chariot, as we say, the contemplation of the throne, and it's another uh, very typical, uh, very typical uh, uh, element. Now, in the book of Enoch, we have a Metatron that is constantly, it's kind of, it functions as a Dante in a certain way because he goes through this journey and relates what he has seen. So, um, always there is this idea that the proximity of God is symbolized, is symbolized the best way for us to represent this experience because, again, the challenge is not just to feel the experience, but then to relate it. And so I want to um, compare here again two short um, dialogues, because we are running out of time, so I will be brief. So in Paradiso uh, 28, Terzine, uh, so the Terzine are 97, okay, you have them there, I don't need to. So here uh, we have the description, the configuration of angels. Of course, you know, there are so many more, but just to be concise. And she, who saw my mind's perplexity, said, the first circle have displayed to you the seraphim and the cherubim. The two penultimate groups of rejoicing ones within the next triad are willing principalities and the archangels flashed the playful angels. So Dante is very clear in telling us, is very careful, just following very much this uh, structure of, uh, mis of uh, Jewish mysticism, that the steps and the uh, elements are there. In Enoch 3, we have Metatron. So Metatron the angel, the prince of the present, said to me, and the cherub be standing in each direction, but the wings of the cherubim surround each other above their head in glory, and they spread them to sing with them a song to him that inhabits the clouds and to praise the fearful majesty of the king of kings with their wings. So, of course, this idea and a beautiful, I think this is a very beautiful, Now, uh, it's anonymous, uh, 
the church in Macedonia, but this basically are the wheels uh, of, uh, that Ezekiel describes. You can see the wheels with the wings, the angels. Uh, and again, uh, we have several representations, but uh, Dante too has always this circular shape of angels. In fact, this the poster, the picture in the poster, has this same idea of these angels with, with wings. Perhaps an allegory to our brain that is capable to elevate to uh, dimensions that we probably don't think we can reach. Okay, I want to just briefly uh, uh, come to a conclusion today because I know it's uh, material that uh, is burning your uh, <laughs> cells, brain cells and I don't want to kill too many of them or you will blame your teachers for that. But anyway, um, okay, the, the alphabetic letters and the revelation of the presence of two men. So in Jewish, of course, in the traditional Jew, uh, Jewish mysticism, the import, the creation of letters uh, is incredible. In fact, the logos, the communication of God, uh, the, uh, uh, of course, laws, the divine laws, all this is possible only through uh, the creation of letters. And I really mean the physical creation of letters. Now, uh, we were discussing with uh, Dr. Travillian about the <laughs> transition from pictorial letters to alphabetical letters, and I suspect that we will be discussing about this for the next 20 years. <laughs> but, and of course, he's always right. He is, I mean, serious. But uh, yes, we were just talking about this and uh, saying how important this. Now, in the Divine Comedy, we have, of course, this description of Dante, Dante tells us how these letters are formed in heaven. And in Jewish mysticism, especially in the Bahir, long discussions, beautiful discussion about the formation of Hebrew letters, the alphabet. So as God the manifestation to man, and again, as conditio sine qua non, without which we could not have... Um, uh, the laws, mosaic laws, and commandments. So, uh, where the, the principle, the base to uh, um, the development of human society. So, I also want to uh, remind again that according to the principle of Gematria, each letter has a numeric value. And now, Hebrew. Uh, is different from many languages because basically ancient Hebrew, classic Hebrew, and modern Hebrew are the same. There isn't much change. It's, it's basically the same language. So, and also doesn't have many, doesn't have uh, idioms, many idioms, and so on. So it's very, very, uh, very clear uh, alphabet with, you know, uh, a clear structure. So uh, let's look at the formation of these letters and see how Dante again follows a very similar pattern. So in Paradiso, these tercine are really poetic and artistic and just as birds that rise from the river bank as if rejoicing after feeding there will form a round flock or another shape so in their lights, the saintly being sang, and in their flight, the figure of this, uh, that they spelled, well, now a D, now an I, and now an F. This is, of course, in reference to diligite justitia, ecclesiastic translation. So follow the justice, you rule the world. Follow the right laws. And in the uh, Bahir, we find this uh, very intriguing, but it goes on for many, many pages. I just want to give you a, a brief uh, example. So we have, why is the letter bat closed on all sides and open in the front? This teaches us that it is the house bite of the world. God is the place of the world, and the world is not this place. Do not read that, but by it, house. It is thus written, Proverbs 24, 3, 
With wisdom, the house is built. With understanding, it is established. And with knowledge, are its chambers filled. So there is this constant reference to letters as symbolic divine revelation connection between man and God. OK, I um, should have, maybe I don't. Maybe I do. Okay, let me speak up a little bit. This is the question of purgatory, and maybe we elaborated on this um, already and said that this is usually seen as the intermediary stage of um, to the ascension for this, uh, of course, the to ascend to the glory of God. And this, uh, for the purpose of the Divine Comedy, is uh, Dante invention. But uh, we, saw, we see it in the tradition of uh, Jewish mysticism as a stage of uh, preparation. Now, I think that we should maybe just emphasize a little bit the function of life is very important. So light in uh, biblical texts and references is very, very important because where uh, there is light, there is the presence of God. And without, uh, when light is, uh, when we, uh, light is taken away from humans, usually uh, in the tradition, this is associated to perhaps not a very uh, uh, positive inclination of God toward uh, humans because of sin. So we said this, of course, in the, in the Divine Comedy, in Inferno is clear, uh, Dante is clear, he says that it's a dark place. He says that the worst punishment for the sinners is not to see the light of God. Uh, in Judaism, the primal light, oh, and I will uh, read it here so I synthesize it a little bit better. In Judaism, the primal light was shown to God to, by God to Adam, and only through the, this light Adam was able to see the world in its entirety. Jewish tradition also reminds us that the light was later shown to David and also that true light God revealed to Moses, the land of Israel. In Jewish tradition, the presence of light is associated with the favor of God. The absence of light is associated with God's unfavorable disposition to men. Therefore, sinners are deprived from the enjoyment of light, which is always reserved for the righteous ones. So we said uh, the, 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 the same uh, um, element is, or the same idea is expressed by um, Dante. Now, let me again compare in the text where we find this, how we find this idea of light. So uh, this is from the Zohar. By the way, the Zohar, the, the translation is Book of Splendor. So we see the idea of light right there. So Rabbi Sack said, at the creation, God irradiated the world from end to end with light, but then it was withdrawn. So as to deprive the sinners of the world of its enjoyment, and it is stored away for the righteous, and it stands writ. Uh, written, light is sown for the righteous. Then, will the words be in harmony and all will be united into one? But until the future world is set up, the, this light is put away and hidden. This light was hewed out by the strokes of the most secret. And here, I want to uh, give you a visual, a visual representation. Okay, this is from the Bahir again, of the Tsim Tsum. Uh, somebody here, I'm sure many of you have seen this picture. This is nothing else than the, basically the representation of creation, where uh, uh, God, in order to create, had to, in a certain way, <laughs> to retract 
and make space for creation. And then this ray of light was the beginning of creation. It's the first manifestation of creation. So uh, light is always seen in all Dante and in biblical, of course, tradition, mystical text. It's always, it's always associated with the idea of God. If I'm not mistaken, and I better be careful because we have the authorities, that the Spanish mysticism, Santa Teresa de Avila, so, so we always have this idea of the light that appears in us. Okay, so there is a consistency there. And, um, well, I think I want to just conclude uh, with the Paradiso, the culmination of Dante experience, mystical experience, and again, all uh, a celebration of invocation of light and celebration of light. And with this, I will conclude the lecture tonight. Please read it with me if you wish, in Italian though, because in English I... It's easier to read it in Italian, and it's because of the rhyme is so easy, believe me, it will be easier for you too. So this is the culmination of Dante experience. It's close to uh, divine revelation after this long journey, after the purification, after the elevation, after this continuous dialogue with uh, his interlocutor. At the very end, uh, the closing stage of the divine comedy invocates light and he says, O luce eterna che sola in te sidi, sola ti intendi e da te intelletti, intentente te ami e arrivi quella circolazione che si concetta pareva in te come il lume riflesso dagli occhi miei quanto circunspetta dentro da sé del suo colore stesso mi parve pinta della nostra effigie perché il mio viso in lei tutto era messo qual è il geometra che tutto si affige per misurarlo cerchi e non ritrova pensando quel principio delle indige tale era io a quella vista nova veder volea come si convenne l'immago al cerchio e come vi si indova ma non erano da ciò le proprie penne se non che la mia mente fu percossa da un fulgore in che sua voglia venne all'alta fantasia a cui mancò possa, ma già volgeva il mio disio al velle, siccome rota, che ugualmente è mossa l'amor che muove il sole e le altre stelle. And this is the final terzina of the Divine Comedy, and Dante's told us in details more than any other poet and more than any other writer about is a uh, mystical experience, except, again, for the tradition of our uh, Jewish mystics who uh, wrote and talked and uh, discussed their mystical experience and their uh, desire to, of course, understand God creation. And with this, I leave my students because it's late and I want to go. <laughs> Am I supposed to take questions? Yeah, okay. Questions. Yes. Well, I just want to thank you. I came very late. Ah, <laughs> okay. um, I think this has been very interesting from the, I mean, from the philological point of view because I think it's very always to look at the text from the rules. Each word, you know, and especially if you're talking about Renaissance, I mean, about Italian from the Renaissance, all Italian, and trying to see the words, I think it's very interesting to have this philological analysis of poetry in order to compare with the Hebrew. And um, also, well, it's not like a question, but it's just a comment about, you know, this idea of uh, Jewish um, mystical experiences and mysticism and then comparing that with Christian mysticism. Everything you were talking about is it's very similar. It's very similar. It's exactly. Yes, it's, it's very, it's and very similar. To be referred to a house, like 
like the whole idea of getting to know God passing through a house? Yes, because of course there's the idea that the bed, yeah. the basic bed, is the pictorial of the house, and then inside the, this is the house of God. Yeah. So in order to understand, our brain has to have some sort of, we need to have a, uh, a reference. We cannot think in terms completely abstract. And also God, of course, the function of letters, of language, we have to have it because the brain, otherwise, we need to have some uh, circumscribed land. And this is what Dante does here. When he tells, for example, that time collapses and, and space collapses, and 2,000 years feel like one second, maybe not even one second. This is when we have to transcend completely the idea of space and time because in the presence of this divine, divine, of course, time doesn't count. So yes, exactly, we need to have like some sort of reference so that we, how do we say in poetry, how do we describe in poetry these concepts that are so abstract? We have to find some similitude, some of course. So, and the same thing is letters. I mean, how do letters are, they start with the house. We were talking about that. So if you see that the picture of the house and the bed is very similar, then you take off, we call the roof, because when we write the alphabetic letter, of course, is a simplification of it. But that's, of course, all alphabets, I would think, I would think. But yes, but you're absolutely right. If we read the uh, Christian experience, in this is the same. It's the same. And now, of course, chronologically, though, we have to keep in mind that, especially in the in the case of the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, these are very, very old documents. So, I guess at this point, it's mainly a, a matter of the root where it comes, the tradition where it comes from. So it's kind of like an historical if we wish, uh, reconstruction of the tradition, but you are absolutely right. There is a total integration. And it's so beautiful, the book. It's very beautiful. Equally beautiful to Dante. <laughs> and they are sad. See, Dr. Isabella. I think this is absolutely fascinating. And my question now is, do you think that Dante is the Well, for sure, on Emmanuel ben Solomon, for sure, because he produced himself, he produced a work that is very, very similar to the work that done, the poetic journey of Dante, uh, but it's written only in Hebrew. One canto has been translated, and I happen actually to have it, um, the 14 canto. And this, we always talk about the influence of Dante on Emmanuel ben Solomon because he had, of course, tremendous influence. But let's remember, though, that during the Middle Age, like you, the, 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 the cultural atmosphere was very different from what is now also. So there was an exchange of, the tradition was, we know, I mean, Dante knew very well about the, you know, the books of the, the, the Hebrew Bible, of course, and Emmanuel ben Solomon knew about Christianity. So there was a very positive interaction, but absolutely Dante is considered to be traditional literature. Criticism will tell us that Dante was the maestro, if we wish, of Emmanuel ben Solomon. But Emmanuel ben Solomon was more the theologian. He was very, uh, very skilled in the art of Kabbalah. So this idea of inter uh, the interpretation of the text at times in an allegoric way, at times in a symbolic way, especially, in this, uh, especially for the fact that Hebrew as a language has a symbolic numerical values. So this is where Dante, of course, learned, learned from him because this is a discipline in which Jewish mysticism excel and we cannot, you know, of course, we cannot deny that. Of course. See? No? See? 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 Okay, great. Okay, I think we're ready to go for it. Thank you.